This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for Earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. Language. Without some form of language, it's very difficult to communicate, but not all languages are spoken. In addition to sign language, one language called La Gomera, which is used off the coast of Spain, consists entirely of whistles. Hi, I'm Miles Roby, and you're listening to World's Last Chance Radio. A language of whistles. Do you think that would be hard to learn, Dave? Well, that's really interesting, isn't it? It makes me wonder, actually, if the, if the grammar is more rudimentary. Just how complex of ideas can you communicate by whistling? I don't know, actually. I mean, as you know, languages and words have always fascinated me. Because uh, did you actually know that people who speak Chinese use both hemispheres of their brain, but people who speak English only use their left side? No, I didn't actually know that, no. Mm. I wonder, actually, having said that, if that explains why an artistic type of person maybe struggles with English grammar, even if it is his or her native tongue. Why, doesn't everyone struggle with grammar? (laughs) Well, no, I I wouldn't say so. Although English grammar is more straightforward than most other languages, would you believe, it's our spelling that is so atrocious, with so Mm. many exceptions to the rules. Yeah, that's what we get for adopting so many words from other languages. You see, English has the largest vocabulary of any language in the world, with over 250,000 words in it. And Cambodian, now that has the largest alphabet. Now, can you guess how many letters it has? Oh, uh, 35, maybe 40. More? Uh, 60, 60. Try 74. Wow, that would take quite a while to learn, wouldn't it, really? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I I love languages and I really enjoy words as well. Yeah, how many languages do you speak? Uh, well, I mean, I love them, but only two, to be honest. Uh, but I'm working on a third as well, because you can never know too many. And knowing multiple languages can make for some very interesting experiences. And how do you mean by that? Well, a woman by the name of Amina Chentov tells about an interesting experience that she had when visiting Cairo. Now, I don't know where she's from originally, but she was visiting Cairo with her husband and daughter, and she decided she wanted to visit a famous bazaar called the Khan El Khalili Bazaar. Her husband and daughter weren't that interested, so she went by herself while they went off and did something else. She enjoyed the cultural experience, sauntering along, looking at the wares for sale in the little shops. Now, I don't know if it was her appearance or the way she was dressed, but it was clear that she was a foreigner. Mm. In one colourful little shop, she asked the clerk what the price was for a particular item that caught her eye, and turning to another man, the clerk asked in Arabic, hey, how much do you want to charge this foreigner for this? Oh, what did he say? Well, you can see where this is going, can't you? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Charge her five times the initial price, the other man said. These stupid foreigners always pay. So the man turns back and says, if you're interested, madam, you can get it for almost nothing. (laughs) And she knew this because... Because Arabic is her native language too. Oh (laughs) no, so what happened? Well, she informed him in perfect Arabic that this foreigner had no interest in purchasing anything from him, turned and walked out. Oh, you've got to be so careful, haven't you, these days? See, the world's become such a small place, and you should never assume that no one around you understands what you're saying, and even if it's not the native tongue commonly spoken there. And, and speaking of tongues, by the way, let's talk about speaking in tongues. Paul had quite a bit to say about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me just ask first, though, is speaking in tongues something everyone can do? And is it something a true Christian should be able to do? Well, 
That's a very good question. A number of Christians believe that the ability to speak in tongues, which Scripture says is a gift of the Spirit, is something that is proof you have the Spirit. Right. Okay. So basically a litmus test of how devout or committed or real a Christian you are. Well, yeah, that's what it often comes down to. And as you can imagine, the pressure is immense. If everyone around you is speaking in tongues, there's going to be a tremendous amount of peer pressure to do the same mm. thing, to, to prove that you're a committed Christian too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I hate to say it, but Christians can be the most judgmental, critical individuals around. It's really too bad and not like Christ at all. No, more like the Pharisees than Christ, actually. So mm -hmm. why don't you just grab your Bible there and let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And okay. let's take a look at what Paul is really saying about tongues and the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, so it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, which verses are we going to, Dave? Well, in fact, let's just start at verse 1 and let's make our okay. way through the chapter. Right. It's always important to read the entire thing because this chapter has been misused by quoting some part of it and then ignoring other parts. Mm. Yeah, okay, right. It says, Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Yahushua, be cursed. And no one can say, Yahushua is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So this is just basic. You're not going to curse Yahushua if you're speaking under the inspiration of Yah's Spirit. Likewise, with our fallen natures, we're not going to be able to see and appreciate Yahushua for who he is, except by Yah's Spirit. That's just foundational. Now he's going to expound and talk about what sets apart believers as different. Okay, go ahead. It's verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. So this is still basic info, but it's important. Here he's yeah. saying that there are different kinds of gifts. They're not all the same. But it's still Yah's spirit that dispenses them. Okay, keep going. Now to each one of the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Now, this passage, what is it, verses uh, 7 to 11? It, well, yes, it is, yeah. Now, this is the crux of where people disagree, and this is what we need to talk about today. There are some very sincere Christians that take this passage to mean that every true Christian will manifest all of the gifts listed here. In fact, the presence or absence of what Paul calls gifts are taken as evidence of the individual believer's level of devotion or security. See, I've encountered that belief before, and, you know, it, it really does bring a lot of pressure to bear on the individual. In fact, I mean, I've wondered if this is the basis for the modern practice of speaking in tongues. So what, what the passage, or the pressure to prove your devotion as a true Christian? Well, both really, Dave. I mean, obviously, this is the passage you, you'd point to, but also the, the pressure to prove you can speak in tongues too. And so what what they do is just a a bunch of gibberish, you know, that's all they speak. And have you ever actually been to a service where they speak in tongues? It's just gibberish when the words have no meaning. And yet, that's not how speaking in tongues is presented in Scripture, though, is it? You're right. In fact, let's just take a moment to read how speaking in tongues is described in Scripture so that we have that comparison fresh in our minds. Will you just turn to Acts chapter 2, please? Now, mm. this, of course, is the day of Pentecost when the apostles were baptised with the Holy Spirit. And one of the effects was the ability to speak in tongues. Not gibberish, but other real languages. Why don't you start reading at um, verse 5, please? Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. 
utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of Yah in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. I was counting up there, actually, Miles, as you were reading, and in addition to the Aramaic spoken in Israel at the time, if you assign a language to every place mentioned in that list, you've got 14 different languages. Judea is listed, but they spoke Aramaic there, so 14 different languages in addition to Aramaic. Sounds like different believers were speaking different languages then. It does, and they probably were. But if you just drop down there to verse 14 and start reading from there for us. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, Elohim says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So here we have Peter speaking to the crowd. His sermon goes on for quite a long way further, actually. Mm -hmm. But let me just ask you this. Is the crowd all hearing Peter for themselves, or... Are the other apostles translating for Peter in the 14-plus different languages spoken by the people in the crowd? Oh, no, there's no indication that the crowd needed Peter's sermon to be translated. They all understood what he was saying. So, in a sense, you could say that the crowd had the gift of interpretation, couldn't you? They could all Mm. understand what he was saying. Yeah, right, and it wasn't gibberish after all. No, and it was very well thought out, well presented sermon. The point is, it was understandable. You look up every single instance where speaking in tongues is described in the Bible, and it was all with known languages. No gibberish like with modern glossolalia. But that's what you get when your native tongue is, say, Hindi, but you don't suddenly have the ability to speak Japanese, or Quechua, or whatever. But you still have to prove you're a true Christian. So you open your mouth and what comes out? Gibberish, made up sounds. Right. That's a huge difference between biblical speaking in tongues and the modern equivalent. Modern speaking in tongues can't be understood by anyone. So what's the point? I know they'll claim they're speaking to God, but that's not why the Spirit gives the gift of tongues. Mm, Well, sometimes they have someone standing up to interpret what's being said. Sure, and they'll base that on uh, verse 10 there, where the interpretation of tongues is listed as a gift of the Spirit. But again, we saw the real version of that in Acts 2, where the entire crowd was given the gift of interpretation of tongues so that they all understood what Peter was saying. But he wasn't standing up there babbling mumbo-jumbo nonsense. He was speaking a known language, probably Aramaic, and they were all able to understand what he said. So in a way, the gift of hearing then? Right, yes. Now, we're working our way through chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, but I want you to flip over really quickly now just to chapter 14, because there's a verse here that shares an important principle about Yahweh, and it applies here in chapter 12 just as much as it does in chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, Yes, verse 33. So what does it tell us about Yahweh? For Yahweh is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Just as Yahweh invites in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 to come now and let us reason together, in the New Testament he's still a God of logic, reason and rationality. He doesn't manifest the weighty matters of truth in nonsensical gibberish. Yeah, but so how does this passage, which so far, I know we haven't read through the entire chapter yet, but so far it's, it's quite clear. How does it get twisted into being a standard by which one can assess one's own level of devotion and judge whether or not another is a true Christian? 
Well, there are different explanations given. For example, some people say that the context of these gifts is what should or can be manifested in a church meeting. Obviously, not everyone would speak in tongues in the meeting or you'd never get anything done. Yeah. This itself is a twist, though. When you take this passage in context with the rest of the chapter, it is clearly speaking about believers as a whole. Believers, as members of the body of Christ, have different functions not just in church meetings, but as members of the body of Christ. That is the context of this chapter. To claim otherwise is to twist it out of context. Yeah, certainly true. You can see that in verses 9 and 10. You know, Paul lists gifts of healing and working miracles as gifts of the Spirit too. Right. But no one is saying that someone in a church meeting should stand up and work a miracle or raise the dead or whatever. I mean, let's face it, that would certainly be a meeting to remember, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we return, maybe you could explain further how this passage is twisted to support the modern talking in tongues, which is so different from what's described in the Bible. Yeah, sure. Okay, right, we'll be right back. 1 of Yahweh's greatest gifts is the gift of companionship and friendship with a life partner. Even in paradise, Adam was lonely. Being able to go through life sharing its joys and sorrows with your best friend is truly a divine gift. Sadly, today more marriages end in divorce than ever before. Plenty of studies have been done showing what issues lead to problems in marriage which, if left unresolved, can culminate in divorce. This is valuable information to have but there are also secrets to having a lasting, happy marriage that enriches one's life and gives glory to Yah. If you're married or thinking about getting married, look on our website for the article entitled The Mathematics of Marriage. You can also listen to the programme entitled The Secret to a Successful Marriage. Your marriage doesn't have to join the growing numbers of divorce rates across the world. Learn how you can fully embrace Yah's gift of a lifetime partner. Read The Mathematics of Marriage on worldslastchance.com. You can also listen to The Secret to a Successful Marriage on our website or on YouTube. So you said there was another explanation given for the gifts of the Spirit being something we should be seeing and doing today. Yes, uh, and this is probably the most damaging explanation and is probably the one most responsible for the modern assumption that all this gibberish they do meets the biblical definition of speaking in tongues. And that mm. is the belief that a true believer should have the ability to operate all gifts all of the time. Now, obviously, not everyone does, so that leaves you with just one conclusion to draw, and that is that they are either unwilling or lack sufficient faith to do so. So, so guilt? Well, they'll concede that certain people have different strengths, and so they're more naturally adept at one gift or another. But yes, the expectation is that a truly devout Christian will have the ability to operate all gifts all the time. So again, there's a burden of guilt on everyone who doesn't. Well, let's face it, under that kind of pressure, wouldn't you let loose a stream of gibberish instead of trying to heal someone who's on their deathbed from cancer? Sure. One is easier to fake than the other. Uh -huh. But this really comes from a misinterpretation of what Paul is saying here, especially in the early part of chapter 12. Can you just read verses 4 to 7 again, please? Yeah. Okay. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Verse 7, the word but, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Some Christians emphasize this word, explaining that the use of this word provides a contrast between what came before to what follows next. So, manifestations then are different from gifts. That's what they say, yes. So the nine things listed after verse 7 are all manifestations of one gift. However, that's imposing a meaning on Scripture that actually isn't supported by the original text. And how do you mean? Well, Generally, the word translated into English as but comes from the Greek ala. 
This is the word used to mark a strong contrast, which is what they're saying Paul is trying to do here. But if you look up the actual word, it's not ala in the original Greek. Instead, it's de. This word just marks a transition between phrases. In fact, it can be translated as moreover, now, thus, or, or even and. So why don't you read that again, only this time use the word and instead of but. Just read verses 4 and 7. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit and the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. You can also correctly translate this as, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Thus, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So to hang your entire doctrinal point on translating it but is incorrect, and it gets people right off the point. Read verses 7 to 10 again, using thus. Thus the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kind of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So the thing I want you to notice here is that these are all different ways the Spirit is manifested, but there is nothing here to suggest that they are all manifestations of the same gift. In fact, if you compare this list of various gifts with other passages of Scripture, you'll see that these are all gifts listed in no particular order and not even an exhaustive list at that. Where, where else does it list gifts of the Spirit? I mean, I think most of us think uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when we think of gifts of the Spirit. Well, um, there's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. And okay. um, uh, just hold on a second then, because let me just find that, see what it says. Okay. Um, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. First Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Okay. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of Yah. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of Yah. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which Yah supplies, that in all things Yahuwah may be glorified through Yahushua Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 8. Just there. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So you can see that the list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is by no means an exhaustive list. Another important point that's easy to overlook is found in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Why don't you just read that again? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. But, or thus, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Notice the word manifestation is singular. It's not manifestations, it's simply manifestation, singular. The manifestation is the showing forth of the presence of the Spirit. There may be, and are, many different ways the Spirit shows forth, but it is the same Spirit. In other words, the proof of the Spirit is given to each believer for the common good. I remember being told once that the two in verse 8 should actually be translated for, and that the word one refers to one prophet. Okay, you've lost me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's read verse 8 again. Okay. 
For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Okay, now I was told that it should really read, quote, For one prophet is given the word of wisdom, to another prophet the word of knowledge. Wait, well, I don't, wait a minute. You, you were told that only prophets were given these gifts like Elijah and Elisha. Now you're thinking of prophet as in P-R-O-P-H-E-T. I'm meaning prophet as in P-R-O-F-I-T. Ah, okay, yeah, sorry, that makes more sense. Yeah, it does. <laughs> the thing is, there's nothing in the Greek to support that, and it would actually be a mistranslation to impose that meaning. I think the most common way people misconstrue this passage, though, is to insist that the closer to Yah a believer is, the more devout he or she is, the more all of these gifts will be manifested. Hmm. So I notice that in verse 11, it says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Who's the he referring to here, the Spirit or is it the believer? Ah, oh, yeah, now that's a really good question. Christians who claim that the truly devout will manifest all gifts of the Spirit insist that the he refers to the individual believer. But when you read that verse in context with the rest of the chapter, is that really what it's saying? Read from verse 12, and let's take a look at this in context. Okay. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now Yahuwah has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? This is a brilliant metaphor that Paul is crafting here, and it clarifies just who the pronoun is in verse 11. The pronoun in verse 18 is clear. It's talking about Yahuwah. But now Yahuwah has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. So this is the context of verse 11. So it is reasonable to deduce that the he, in verse 11, is referring to the spirit of Yah, not the individual believer. And that is what's consistent. Also, in verses 7 to 11, it's clear that to one believer is given one gift, while to another believer is given another gift. And that's supported by his metaphor of a body. So it's not as the person wills, but as Yahweh wills. Yeah, I've always liked this illustration. You can just hear the smile in Paul's voice as he asks, If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing... Where would be the smelling? <laughs> I, just, I just love it. I, it's a great passage. And pay careful attention to what Paul is not saying here too. And what he's not saying is just as important as what he is saying. His point is that Yahweh has designed a function for every part, and every part is to perform the function assigned. However, he does not say that every part can be every other part if they just will hard enough or have enough faith. The eye can't be the ear. The foot can't be the hand if it just has strong enough faith. <laughs> That's true. It doesn't say that every individual part should aspire to do every function. No, every individual part has its own function, and Yahuwah chooses which part does which function. Yahuwah chooses, not the part choosing for itself. You can see that, that same thing here in our work at WLC. I mean, there are the content creators that write for the website and produce narration scripts for the videos. Then there are many, many translators. There's also those who make the videos and those who work with the radio programs in the different languages. And then there are people involved with the technical aspects of posting and updating the website, uploading to YouTube and Twitter. It's a huge operation, but not one person's work is more important important than another's. It takes all of us to do what we do. 
I thought the content creators uploaded their own work. No, actually, in fact, I have it on good authority that the person that's probably our most prolific content creator is, shall we say, technologically challenged. <laughs> and uh, if tasked with uploading as well as writing, nothing would ever be added to the website. It takes others more skilled and more knowledgeable in that area to keep the website current. Well, take us, for instance. We broadcast in English. There's no way we could reach the listening audience of those who broadcast in Arabic or Hindi or Mandarin. It's true, yes. I really want to get through to the end of this chapter, though. So would you pick up where we left off? Which verse was that? Um... Uh, it was uh, picking up at verse 20, okay. and it says, But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, on these we bestow greater honour. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But Yahuwah composed the body having given greater honour to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now he's coming to the climax now of this entire chapter. Now you are the body of Christ, and members individually. And Yahuwah has appointed these in the church, first apostles... Second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. So this is the point. We are all members of one body, the body of Christ. Just as Yahuwah formed Adam's body from the dust of the ground and assigned a certain work to the ears, that's a different work from that given to the feet, so he also assigned us our own particular work as members of Christ's body. But we're all sinners. We've still got our fallen natures. We like to assign greater or lesser importance to various body parts, just as we like to assign greater or lesser importance to the gifts of the Spirit. But that's not Yah's plan for us. We're to work cooperatively with the rest of the body of Christ, always esteeming others as more important than ourselves. And if one part is given the gift of tongues, that would be like part of the body being the mouth. And if another is given the gift of healing, that would be like part of the body being the hands. One is not more important than another, but each is vital in the role Yah has assigned it. Yeah, we always like to puff ourselves up, don't we? It's our fallen natures, which is why from here Paul shows his readers a more excellent way. And that more excellent way, of course, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is known as the love chapter. But this entire notion that every believer should possess every gift of the Spirit is an idea that has been imposed upon this passage. When you read it in context, it's clear that Yah gives different gifts to different people. I was noticing the marginal reading here for the word tongues. Tongue sounds so mysterious, which is why those involved in modern-day glossolalia call their gibberish a tongue and claim they're speaking to God. But the marginal reading is simply languages. Language, by definition, is the communication of thoughts and feelings through a system of arbitrary signals such as voice sounds, gestures or written symbols. Communication must be two-way. Therefore, by definition, the meaningless, nonsensical gibberish of modern speaking in tongues just does not fit what the Bible is describing as being a gift of the Spirit. No, it really doesn't. All right. Stay tuned. Up next, Dave is going to share the secrets of having rock-solid confidence in Yah. We'll be right back. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31-metre band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.
World's Last Chance provides more than radio programmes. Visit our website for articles, videos, computer apps, Bible study aids and more. WorldsLastChance.com Preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Today's question from our Daily Mailbag is coming to us from Qatar. Where? Qatar. Oh, do you know, I think that's the first time we've had a question from there. I think think it is. Do you think it's exciting, though, to see our listening audience spreading? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, see, Qatar is uh, one country that really fascinates me. It's been ranked as the safest country in the entire world. What? What, Middle Eastern country ranked as the safest? Yeah, surprising, isn't it? But the Numbeo Crime Index ranked Qatar as the safest country in the world with the lowest amount of crime. Uh, This was in 2017, 2019, 2020, and again in 2021. Wow. So how do we compare? Where does England fall, I wonder? Well, we didn't do so well, I'm afraid. Uh, The United Kingdom came in down at 71. Oh, that hurts. Yeah, China came in at 30. Seriously? We came in behind yeah. China? Yeah, don't worry. You can dull down your competitive nature right now. The US came in at 80. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay, that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, and dare I ask, which country was considered the most dangerous? Well, uh, for 2021, it was Venezuela. Uh, the interesting thing about Qatar is that its safety records make it a really attractive place for expats. So only 12% of the population are actually Qataris, I suppose you could say. Uh, the rest of the population are all foreigners attracted to the good weather and laid-back lifestyle. It's, it's become quite the melting pot, to be honest. Well, how interesting. I never knew that. Right, OK. So from that, what's our question for today? Well, it, it's one I think a lot of our listeners will be able to relate to. And it says, How are some people so confident in Yahuwah? No matter what happens in their lives, their confidence remains strong. It's something I've always struggled with. I want to have confidence like that, but if I'm being strictly honest, I don't. How can I have confidence like that too? The secret to having rock-solid confidence in Yahuwah is in having a personal relationship with him. Not one where your experience is limited to listening to a sermon about him once a week, but one where you are personally acquainted with him. Basically, what it boils down to is confidence comes from personal knowledge. For example, if I were to come to you and tell you about, say, uh, a dentist. Now, no one really likes going to the dentist. But if I were to tell you about a new dentist that I'd gone to that was able to help me and was very gentle and good and, and didn't hurt, you'd be interested. But you might still be worried or even scared when you went to your first appointment with her. However, if, based on your own experience with a dentist... You found that everything I claimed was true, and then some. You'd have confidence in this dentist being good and careful and not painful. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm, yeah. I mean, you see, it's the difference between personal experience versus hearsay. Right, yes. Hearsay can be believable. But if someone more convincing comes along, your beliefs can change. On the other hand, personal experience is far more convincing because you experience something for yourself, so you know for yourself something is true based on your own experience. Let's just take a moment here. I want you to think about someone important to you, someone that you really trust. And just to make that a little more challenging, it can't be a parent. Now, you have a name in mind? Yeah. Okay, then tell me, how did you learn to trust this person? Well, I spent time with her. I got to know her. I shared with her her plans and hopes and dreams, my beliefs. I listened as she shared with me. And as we got to know each other, we had experiences that proved to both of us we could trust the other person. So that's how friendships are formed. That's how trust is developed. And a trusting relationship with Yahweh is no different. You have to actually put in the time getting to know him on a personal level if you want to have confidence in him. Spending time in his word every morning is a great way to get to know him. Also, talk to him. Not just a running list of all your needs and wants, but about the little things too. 
Yeah, I've noticed that my day just seems to go better when I start it with prayer. I mean, I'm, I know mornings, especially workday mornings, are always busy, but allowing time for prayer really sets up the day. It sets it up right. You know what I'm saying, Dave? You know, Have you noticed that too? Absolutely, yes, I have. But I'm not just talking about prayer following your morning devotions, although that is important too. Mm. You don't have to be kneeling with your hands folded and your head bowed when you talk to Yah. Talk to him throughout the day on your way to work, before an important business call. Let your thoughts go to him. You can chat with him about the little matters too. This is how we develop friendships with other humans. It's how we can develop one with our creator too. Yeah, I like how you said that, you know, chatting with Yara about the unimportant things too. It's so easy to pray vending machine prayers, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, why don't you just tell us what you mean by that, just to illustrate well, it? I mean Listen, you, you put some money or swipe your card at the vending machine and you get out what you expect to get. Well, usually anyway, without <laughs> banging the machine a bit. And, and a lot of people pray that way. They go through the motions, Neil. Bow their head, fold their hands, close their eyes. Perhaps they use a bit more formal language. These, thous. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then they begin their prayers, but it's often nothing but a list of asks. Help me remember what I studied for this test. Help me say the right words to this client, etc., etc., etc. It's all, you know, that's that's what it is. Help me, give me, give me, help me. You know, there's there's nothing wrong at all asking for your help. He wants us to, of course. But how many of us take time to actually thank him for all he does for us? How many of us have prayed prayers where absolutely nothing was asked for? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point, yeah. actually. Reminds me of something I read once. It was a question, and, and it asked, what if you woke up tomorrow and the only things you had were what you thanked Yahweh for the day before? Yeah. I think most of us would be rather poor, to be honest. I think. <laughs> yeah, and it's a powerful thought, isn't it? It is. So, again, getting to know Yahweh on an experiential basis for yourself is the key to having confidence in him. I'd just like to share a few Bible verses on having confidence in Yah. Would you turn, please, to Proverbs chapter 14 and yeah. read verse 26 for us? So that's Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26. Okay. It says, In the fear of Yahuwah there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. When we know Yahuwah, as it is our privilege to know him, not based on hearsay, but based on our own personal experience with him, then we will have strong confidence no matter what happens in life. Now turn to Jeremiah chapter 17 and read verses 7 and 8. This is a beautiful description of how our lives are impacted when we develop confidence in Yahweh. Okay. But blessed is the one who trusts in Yahweh, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Go to 1 John chapter 5 now and read verses 14 and 15. There's nothing wrong with asking Yahweh for what you need. Like you said a moment ago, he wants us to. But when we do, we need to take the time to notice when he answers our prayers because mm -hmm. This is what will inspire confidence in our hearts that he hears us and cares for us. Okay, it's 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching Yahuwah, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. This is why people who have confidence in Yah have confidence no matter what is going on in their lives. Through sickness, through the loss of job or loved one, their confidence remains strong. Why? Because they know Yah and know that he loves them. Okay, let's just do a couple more. Let's read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, please. It says, Those who hope in Yahuwah will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Confidence in Yah is what gives the believer stamina to overcome every one of life's trials. I like Psalm 118 verse 8. It says, It is better to trust in Yahuwah 
than to put confidence in man. Amen. Humans will fail us. After all, they're only human, but Yahweh never will. Now, this is something that David knew well. He didn't have an easy life. Let's read what he had to say. Let's go to Psalm 27 and just read the first three verses, please. If anyone had cause to fear, it was David. But instead, no matter what happened, he maintained his confidence in Yah. Okay, Psalm 27, verses 1 through to 3. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. It's a great promise, isn't it? It really is, especially for those of us living now at the end of Earth's history. Yeah, exactly. Now, to conclude, I'd like to read Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. And it says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If Yah is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Don't stop there. Keep going. I love Romans 8. If any chapter can inspire confidence in Yah, it's this one. Starting at verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Yahweh that is in Christ Yahushua our Lord. Amen. That is really, really beautiful. You want to develop confidence in Yahweh? Spend time with him on a one-to-one basis. Look for the ways he has already blessed you. Gratitude for gifts received inspires confidence, and confidence strengthens faith and love. So simple, and yet so profound. It's something each one of us can do to grow our confidence in our Heavenly Father. If you have any questions, comments, or prayer requests, just please go to worldslastchance.com. Click on Contact Us. We really do look forward to hearing from you. Up next is Elise O'Brien with another promise you'll want to claim. Stay tuned. This is Elise O'Brien with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. It was Monday evening, April 4, 2022. The night began as most other evenings. 17-year-old Brittany Deaton was sleeping in an RV trailer that was parked in her parents' yard. Little did she or her parents know what awaited them. Sometime during the night, the wind picked up. It blew and blew hard. Brittany woke up and knew by the violent rocking of the trailer that she needed to get to the safety of the house. However, when she tried to open the door, she found she couldn't. The wind had blown so hard that it had actually wedged the trailer's stairs against the door and they were now blocking it shut. Meanwhile, Brittany's mother and stepfather had heard the winds of what later was determined to be an E-2 tornado. They knew Brittany wasn't safe. Sean Zeleny, Brittany's stepfather, raced outside to make sure his stepdaughter made it safely inside. Sean quickly unblocked the door, but just as Brittany jumped to the ground, a huge gust of wind shoved hard at the trailer. It rolled over Brittany and Sean, with Sean's body taking the brunt of the weight. The weight was crushing. Power lines were down on roads, so it took two hours before Sean, lying in the mud, severely injured, could get help. 
At the hospital, doctors discovered that in addition to a broken nose and broken femur, all of his ribs were broken, and one of his ears had been nearly ripped off and had to be sewn back on. Sean admits that, at the time, he thought he was going to die, but that fear was quickly replaced by determination to survive. He wanted to live for his wife and stepdaughter. Word spread of Sean's actions that likely saved Brittany's life. The media started calling him a hero, but Sean quickly shrugged that aside. Any loving parent would have sacrificed themselves for their children, he said. Watching the news footage of the event and the interviews of Sean and his family, I was reminded of Yahweh's love for us. He will search through the darkest storm, overcome the highest mountain of difficulties just to seek out and save the lost. And through it all, his love for us never wavers. When you feel crushed by life's unexpected trials, know that Yahweh still cares, and he is still working everything out for your ultimate good. One of my favorite gospel hymns says, quote, Life is easy when you're up on the mountain, and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change when you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith, for you're never alone. For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, he'll make them right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. Ezekiel 34 says, For thus says Adonai Yahweh, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold, and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says Adonai Yahweh. I will seek what was lost, and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken, and strengthen what was sick. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. So this probably goes without saying after today's program, but I just want to be crystal clear on this. Do you have to speak in tongues to be saved? Well, let me ask you, do you have to buy your wife an anniversary present? Uh, (laughs) I'll take that as a yes. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously? (laughs) Well, you know, they say happy wife, happy life. (laughs) No, but but seriously, say you've lost your job. Let's say money is tight. Do you really have to buy your wife a birthday present? No, no. It's it's an easy way to show that I love her and she likes getting them, but a gift is a gift, you know? There's no have to about it. And it's the same with speaking in other languages. It's a gift Yah gives when it's necessary for the sharing of the gospel. It's certainly not something that somehow proves our devotion or Christianity. And its presence or absence should never be a standard by which we judge another's spirituality, ever. That's just wrong. Yeah, well, judging is just wrong, isn't it? Christians should be the least judgmental people on planet Earth, but too often we're the most judgmental. And sadly, you're right. And that brings us to where Paul left off in chapter 12. He wanted instead to show his readers a better way. So why don't you read that for us? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, as you read, bear in mind that what Paul is describing here is what he calls better than speaking in tongues. Okay. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, 
I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is what we are to seek, the love that is patient and kind and forgives, love that puts others above oneself and is never full of pride. When we do this, we won't be judging ourselves or others on whether or not we think we or they possess or lack the gifts of the Spirit. Those are Yah's gifts to bestow as He sees fit. Our part is to love as Christ loves, without judgment. Amen. Reminds me of that gospel song that says, They will know we are Christians by our love. That's the light we're to show the world, the love of Yah. Join us again tomorrow, and until then, remember, Yahweh loves you, and he is safe to trust. listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahweh to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. <laughs>